Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining ApacheConf 2021. So this session is Lex Level Spark on Kubernetes with Apache Unicorn Incubating. Uh, thanks for joining. And today, um, my name is Weiwei, and Chao Ran Yu is with me. Uh, so we are co-speaking on this one. A little bit intro introduction about myself. Uh, so I am currently a software engineer in Cloudera. Uh, I'm the co-founder of the Unicorn project and also our Apache Hadoop committer and PMC member. So I'm focusing on resource management and the scheduling, uh, especially for cloud. So trying to um, trying to um, treat the challenges for resource management on cloud. So Chao Ran, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chao Ran. Uh, I work at Apple. Uh, my focus is on uh, building a, uh, a scalable uh, batch processing platform uh, in the cloud. Uh, I've been uh, working with the uh, Kubernetes uh, ecosystem uh, for the past several years. I've been contributing to Unicorn and uh, also the uh, Spark on uh, Kubernetes operator project. And uh, I'm excited to share with you uh, my learnings about Unicorn. Awesome. Thank you. So today uh, we are going to run this session with two parts. So the first part will be running by me. So I will be giving some introduction about Unicorn project, uh, the history and what's the status. And also want to introduce some Spark on Kubernetes with Unicorn Essentials. So basically give you the idea about how to run Spark on Kubernetes and what's the challenges and how to use Unicorn to, to handle some of their uh, difficulties. And the second part will be given by Chao Ran. So he will be talking about how to build a cloud native batch data processing platform at Apple and how Unicorn helps in their case. Um, so let's go, let's go to the part one. First of all, so what is Unicorn? Uh, Unicorn is a standalone resource scheduler for Kubernetes. So that empowers to run large scale batch jobs and services on a shared multi-tenancy Kubernetes cluster. So you, you see, you'll see some keywords here, right? So large scale, batch, and multi-tenancy. So that's the key things we're chasing for. Um, Unicorn, so there are some highlights about the project, right? So first of all, uh, we, we have the decoupled design. So that means we have, uh, we have implemented the core scheduling logic in a core library, uh, which we call the schedule, scheduler core. And we have abstract out uh, interface for all the scheduling um, primitives. So that is scheduler interface. And we have a, a platform, platform related depends, dependent um, shim implementation. So basically with this design, uh, it doesn't mean that Unicorn can only work with Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes is just a form of the uh, scheduler and uh, Unicorn can also support any form of the platforms. And the second highlight is the, so the design is batch oriented which means that when we start a project, we kind of, uh, the major challenge we want to solve is the batch scheduling. And we want to introduce a pretty comprehensive um, with a lot of uh, batch scheduling features, featured scheduler. And the third thing is that uh, we have the hierarchical queues, hierarchical resource queues built in. And also we recognize the app as a first class citizen. And this is currently a Apache Incubator project. Uh, to here, I want to talk about a little more about the uh, two years history about the project. So basically in 2019, um, at the beginning of the 2019, we as a team in, in Cloudera, we start to realize that uh, there's a big gap uh, when we want to move um, our data infra to Kubernetes based um, environments like on cloud or, or private or public or hybrid cloud. So, um, the default scheduler in Kubernetes that was not designed for batch workloads. Uh, in Cloudera, we have a lot of batch workloads and um, the default scheduler just doesn't work for that. And starting from that point, we started to design and propose a project, right? So that project is the is Unicorn. And the key considerations are, we want to decouple the core scheduling logic. So that means we can, so essentially we can use Unicorn anywhere if we want, but the first step is to apply that to, to, to Kubernetes. And uh, also we want to 
introduce the fine grain resource management and this batch oriented, like I just mentioned. And also we, we consider the performance at day one. So we, we listed that as a very, very essential piece for the scheduler. And then, um, so in, in, in July, 2020, and we have a lot of um, organizations start to use Unicorn on production. And the major patterns are using Spark and Flink and Kubernetes with other, some of other data services. And this has been helping the um, members from the community with their production workloads since then. And it's been pretty, pretty good for solving those batch problems. And then um, here now, uh, we are reaching a state where we, we can call it a feature um, maturity because um, right now we have elastic resource quota built in. We have the pluggable apps and node sorting policy and people can customize the scheduler as much as they want. And we also have the dynamic placement rules, uh, which you can uh, easily leverage and, uh, and uh, save a lot of time for configuration. And also we have the gun scheduling, which is the latest new feature in, in the communities that we can, um, we can, we can, this is very useful for the, for the workload like Spark. And also we need to, as a user, we, we might want to understand why we want to run Spark on Kubernetes. So basically uh, Kubernetes is the, right now is the default of the resource management system. Um, a lot of companies are building a unified data infrastructure um, that is through prime on prime cloud, hybrid cloud based on Kubernetes. And also um, if you move Spark to containerize the workloads, uh, that offers better flexibility and also isolation. And uh, the last point is the coexist of the batch jobs and long running services that can achieve better resource utilization as long as we have a very fine green control on the resource management. However, when we move um, Spark workloads on Kubernetes, there are a lot of uh, challenges. Um, a, a list of, of challenges are here. So basically uh, the resource code and management problem, uh, Spark job could deadlock due to AM issues, no hierarchy queues, no job scheduling orders, priority, lack of tracking what's happening on the cluster, performance concerns. I will be spending, uh, spending some time to explain these issues in the next few minutes. So first the issue we saw, uh, so before we having unicorn uh, in our clusters, uh, the first issue we saw that is uh, right now when we have a lot of teams uh, sharing the cluster resources, the only thing we can leverage from the native Kubernetes is the namespace resource quota to limit the usage of each user or tenant. However, that resource quota is high limit, which means um, user's job will immediately fail when the quota is all used. Uh, you will see very bad user experience if from the user point of view, when they submit a job, they expect that either the job gets executed uh, immediately there's resources, in, if there's a resources, enough resources, uh, or the job will be waiting in the queue and wait for a certain amount of time, then get the chance to execute. But right now the case is, if we set a quota for, for the namespace, and if a lot of other users are using the same namespace, the resource quota being used and other, uh, the remaining users were not able to run any jobs. Um, to handle this, if we do not have a you know resource queue like in Unicorn, uh, we will have very very complex client side logic, which is definitely not the not a way we want to go. A second thing is the potential deadlock. Um, if you look at the, this example, right? So I have um, I have a six jobs, and the first first three jobs are are stark, and the uh, um, last three jobs are all filled. The reason for that is again we have uh, limited the resource use utilization for the namespace. And when we submit jobs to the namespace, the first job, first three jobs, uh, all the drivers, driver pods are running and they're essentially taking all the resources from the namespace. This is just an example. When they are taking all the resources from the from the namespace, all these jobs are stark. Uh, there's no resource available for any of the executors. So they will be stuck forever. And uh, all, all of the remaining jobs, like uh, last three ones, they will immediately fail. 
And this is from the user experience, this is really, really bad. Then um, the next thing is the job scheduling semantics. So basically, that is something totally missing from Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes scheduler doesn't have a notion of jobs. It just see a bunch of pods. And so based on that, so there's no job ordering, there's no job never priority, and there's no job level preemption, there's no job resource fairness consideration. And it's also very hard to track the job scheduling status. Uh, from user, that means when you submit a job, if you are sharing a cluster with others, and also if that cluster is busy, when you submit a job, you have no idea what your SAR will be. So this is this is even even worse when you submit a pretty large job on, on a busy cluster. Uh, your job could be starving forever because your the resource could be used by other smaller jobs, things like that. So there's a lot of cases uh, coursing the jobs are not not meeting their SLAs, and those are because the lack of the job scheduling features. Uh, then further, so currently it's very, very hard to support multi-tenancy on Kubernetes cluster because, uh, I mean, for, for, for the batch workloads. Uh, in the batch scenarios, um, we usually leverage the hierarchy resource queues to, to design the resource queues with different resource um, capacities for different tenants and users. And also it's tree-like uh, structure make it easy to for, for, for other means to set up a resource uh, capacity for different level of, um, of tenants. However, on Kubernetes, everything is flat. So it's very difficult to set up something like this. And also when we have the resource queues, we expect the users jobs or whatever services or parts, whatever, will be queued up in each of the resource queue and waiting for the right moment to schedule. But that is not, available in, in any of the current uh, Kubernetes clusters. So um, Unicorn has the hierarchy queue uh, built in, so it can solve these issues easily. Um, so when we have a Spark run on Kubernetes, the first thing we want to know is how that works. So right now, Spark supports two, two flavors to run on Kubernetes. One is the native Spark on Kubernetes, and the second one is through the Spark operator. So both approach works, and I know that there are companies out there to use both op approaches on production, so they'll be working fine. Personally, I, I slightly um, prefer to the Spark operator approach because uh, that is more like cloud native. We have uh, CRDs, we can track uh, more easy for users to track the Spark job status, and more e it's easier. And to, if you want to understand more how this works, you can you know go to the Spark website and understand how uh, behind the scenes how it works on Kubernetes. Uh, what I want to dig dig a little more into is the how Spark on Kubernetes works with the Unicorn. So this is a pretty complex chart, but I want to uh, based on this chart to give you the sense how this works together. The first section is the from the user, what user can see, and the second section is what Kubernetes, what happens on the Kubernetes cluster. And the, the last one is what happens in Unicorn. So let's use a Spark job as an example. So when user submit a Spark job, on Kubernetes cluster, we will see a Spark driver pod gets created and the, the driver pod is pending. And then uh, if we use Unicorn as the scheduler, the pod will be um, submitted to the resource queue, one of the leaf queue in the tree, and that is the unicorn hierarchical queue. And when the job is submitted to the queue, um, because the driver is still waiting for the for the location, and the, what what we did in the unicorn is we iterate all the queues, sort the queues based on the certain policies, then we find the queue need the resource, and in, within this uh, within this queue, we sort all the applications and we find out which application need a resource. And from the application, we sort the, all the requests again and find out which one should get a resource first. Then eventually we find from the notebooks, we find the uh, best, best note for this pod based on the sorting policies we have. 
So this is, we are going over the queues, apps, and then requests and the nodes. Uh, within the logic, assume that we have a place uh, allocated for the pod. Then uh, at this point, the driver pod is still pending, but then we are uh, allocate the pod to a node. Then we're asked the Kubernetes, a unicorn will ask the Kubernetes to bind the pod to the node. And here we will see from the user point of view, after the pod is scheduled, the back driver will be pending, uh, will be running. Once the job is, uh, the driver pod is running and the, the driver pod will initialize and start to request the executors from Kubernetes. So there are, you, uh, from Kubernetes we'll see there are a bunch of executors being created and they are all pending. And all these pending uh, executors will be, again, submitted to Unicorn queues. And each will goes to, because uh, the job is already submitted to the queue. So all these pending asks, uh, pending requests will be added to the application under this queue. And the scheduler will go, go again to, to the scheduling phase, which go over the queues, apps, and the requests and nodes figure out what's the best uh, best the spot for the given pending pod and then allocate that pod to the node. Uh, then what we'll say is that the uh, executors will be bound to the to the to the different nodes and then we'll say the job is running. So this will give you a detailed view about a workflow when um, how Unicorn scheduler works um, and using Spark as example. So um, do you notice the difference? So I want to um, do a side-by-side -side comparison here uh, because Unicorn is a replacement default scheduler and yeah, we'll just put both of them together and see what's the difference. Um, so as your, so a workflow for rest of the uh, procedure is all the same. So still a user submit apps and the apps being submitted Kubernetes and create a pod. And when the pods created, the scheduler will uh, look at how to schedule them. But the difference is when we schedule them, the default scheduler only put a pod, whatever the pods is for, uh, in, a, in a queue for all the pods, and then sort the pods and find the, which pod to, to, to allocate onto a node. There's some certain you know, extension point you can do, but the overall workflow is just look for pod by pod. And that's all. But from Unicorn, the difference is that we have queues, we have apps. So we have two more, two more uh, primitives. So help us to help the help us to do the best scheduling. So every time we we iterate the queues, sort the queues, sort the apps in the queue, we sort of request. So all those things are not exist in the default scheduler. And these are the essential, you know, very critical for providing the advanced job scheduling features including the things that are missing uh, we've been talking about in the challenges. So uh, this is what I want to introduce in part one and just a wrap up. So hopefully in part one, you know that why you got an idea why Unicorn is essential to the batch scheduling, um, especially for Spark, why Unicorn is important in this scenario. And the next, uh, I will stop sharing and uh, try and pretty sure talk about cloud native batch scheduling batch data processing platform at Apple. All right, uh, wonderful. Let me share my screen. Okay. All right, so I assume that uh, you can see my screen. Uh, if not, uh, please let me know. So uh, following the introduction to uh, Spark on Kubernetes and uh, Unicorn, uh, generic information that uh, we just covered, I'm going to talk about how we at Apple are leveraging Unicorn and Spark to build a uh, cloud native platform on Kubernetes that's uh, specifically targeted at uh, large scale uh, batch processing. Uh, I'll start with the business requirements of the platform that we wanted to build when we got started. One major focus of our team at Apple is on batch processing which uh, involves uh, jobs that uh, process a big amount of data and they could run for hours on end. Since uh, we were in the cloud and on Kubernetes, we uh, needed something that, uh, uh, that is Kubernetes native and also have strong support for batch workloads. Furthermore, because we needed to serve 
uh, many users and teams at Apple, our platform had to be able to handle uh, multi-tenancy. One of the most important issues that mattered to us was resource share sharing and isolation between tenants uh, that are hosted on the same uh, Kubernetes cluster. The next requirement that, uh, that we had was uh, cost efficiency, because among the most important reasons that we decided to build a platform on the cloud in the first place was to leverage the flexibility and elasticity of hardware resources in the cloud, which uh, uh, simply put means getting hardware when needed and giving them when idle to save costs. To realize this benefit, the software needs to support it. Last but not the least, we need to have insights into uh, the functioning of the platform so that we can optimize the performance and also get alerted when something goes wrong. Therefore, uh, monitoring and uh, deliverability are a must for us. To meet the uh, business requirements that I just uh, talked about, uh, we basically had uh, two alternatives. One, um, don't do anything special. Uh, AKA sticking with uh, the default uh, Kubernetes scheduler or using a custom scheduler like Unicorn. Uh, here I compare these two options on uh, each of the requirements we have. In terms of uh, support for batch use cases, the default scheduler doesn't have any built-in support. All it knows is part by part scheduling as we just uh, mentioned as well. Unicorn on the other hand has the notion of an application for example, it has uh, admission queues at the application level. It can uh, also do uh, GAN scheduling, uh, which, in case you are not familiar, is a uh, technique for scheduling an entire application as an atomic unit. Uh, when it comes to uh, multi-tenancy features, the default scheduler uses uh, namespaces and their associated resource quotas to, to manage uh, tenants sharing the same cluster. And as you have seen just now, uh, this is a uh, this is very uh, inflexible uh, because uh, all the applications uh, will fail if the resource quota has already been used up. In comparison, uh, Unicorn's queues are more powerful and uh, more generic. A queue doesn't necessarily have to map to a single namespace, and a queue's quota can be a range defined by uh, min and max values. Uh, next, uh, let's look at the cost saving support between these two alternatives. Uh, the default scheduler is not known for being uh, very helpful uh, in this regard, but uh, Unicorn sh uh, shines in this front. Uh, it has a variety of scheduling policies uh, that can dramatically improve the efficiency of auto scaling. Uh, for example, uh, GAN scheduling and beam packing are the most useful uh, features. Uh, they can improve the utilization of existing hardware and can help quickly procure additional uh, computing instances uh, when needed. Now, if we look at the, the last row, again, Unicorn has the competitive advantage because it has a, a nice web UI and it exposes a rich set of uh, Prometheus metrics on the, uh, the entire scheduling uh, cycle. The default scheduler doesn't offer anything uh, in this uh, area. So this table pretty much summarizes the, reason, uh, the reasons that we went for Unicorn. Next, let's look at the role that Unicorn is playing in our AIML batch platform today. First, uh, a big milestone that we hit uh, some time ago was uh, we completely replaced the Kubernetes default scheduler with Unicorn in all our uh, Spark batch processing clusters. Our workloads range from uh, small Spark, Spark jobs that can finish in a few minutes to really big ones that uh, use a, a big number of executors and run for many hours. Unicorn has proved its uh, has proven its uh, stability and performance when scheduling Spark applications at the scale uh, we have. Second, uh, we use Unicorn queues as the foundation uh, of our multi-tenancy strategy. Each team gets their own dedicated queue. That's a concept that uh, our uh, user teams work with. They don't get direct exposure to the underlying hardware. This gives us the flexibility on choosing uh, instance types and managing node count under the hood. And each queue gets a quota that indicates the maximum resource, the maximum amount of resources that uh, this team can use. Next, we uh, provide a dashboard uh, and UIs for admins and users alike to monitor the resource usage. 
Uh, for administrators, we get insights into uh, cluster information, such as the uh, real-time node count of each ECAS cluster, the scheduling performance, uh, etc. For users, they can visualize how much CPU and memory they are using in real time. They are also free to set up alerts, for example, based on how much percentage of the maximum queue capacity has been consumed. And uh, as I'll show in the next slide, Unicorn deployed on our platform is well integrated with the, the Spark operator. Uh, if you're not familiar, uh, uh, it's, we don't have uh, time to go into details in this talk, but uh, in summary, it's a project uh, that was uh, originally open sourced by Google Cloud that offers a Kubernetes native way of managing the life cycle uh, of a Spark application. We have contributed to Unicorn to support this integration, and our internal version of the Spark operator also contains the improvements uh, that's, that are needed for this integration. Last, I want to emphasize again that uh, Unicorn is serving production Spark workloads for us. It's not just a uh, proof of concept or an experiment. It's serving large-scale production uh, environments on, on our EKS uh, uh, clusters. Now, uh, knowing that uh, Unicorn plays a critical role in our platform, let's uh, take an overview of the architecture of our platform and see how Unicorn fits with other components we have. Uh, this is a uh, high-level view of the architecture uh, that we have. From the top, uh, our users uh, interact with our batch service using a CLI tool that we have developed in house, or they can schedule a Spark jobs via, uh, via an Airflow operator. All the user requests go through uh, our gateway service, which dispatches them to a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, specifically, we use Amazon EKS. Let's follow the, the journey of one job submission request that gets routed to an EKS cluster shown on this uh, slide. So this request contains all the information uh, that's needed to launch a Spark application. Uh, things like uh, the number of executors, uh, memory and CPU requirements, etc. On this ECAS cluster, we run multiple instances of the Spark operator. And one such operator instance uh, takes the customer resource definition or uh, CRD object containing this uh, job information and starts running the job. And the job contains uh, labels that indicate the, the queue that this job belongs to. And when Unicorn sees the driver and executor paths for this Spark application, it will recognize the queue from the labels and account for the resource quotas accordingly. Uh, on the same cluster, we also have uh, uh, other uh, auxiliary tools uh, like FluentBit and uh, Datadog that export uh, logs and metrics. This is a scalable architecture because uh, each in individual ECAS cluster can be scaled out to handle more, uh, more workloads. Queues can also uh, be spread across uh, multiple ECAS clusters. So you might still have some questions on how or uh, why we made some design decisions. Uh, I'll, I'll dive into some of those uh, in the next slide. Um, first, I uh, have a few words about the dispatch strategy used by the gateway service. Each eCache cluster hosts uh, one or more uh, queues in our setup. And the gateway service has uh, a record, has an in-memory record of which cluster uh, hosts which queues. When it, when it makes a routing decision, the gateway service uh, only routes a Spark application uh, uh, submission request to an EKS cluster that has the uh, supported queue. Second, uh, you might remember that we have uh, multiple EKS clusters behind uh, a single gateway service. Uh, and we have multiple uh, Spark operator deployments on the e each individual EKS cluster uh, as well. This is to, to balance the workload so that we don't put too much pressure on any particular EKS cluster or on any particular Spark operator instance. Uh, also, regarding our multi-tenancy model using Unicorn queues, uh, this is a model that we have used to completely replace the uh, Kubernetes namespace uh, resource, resource quota-based uh, model. We have a, uh, in our deployment, we have a fixed number of namespaces per EKS cluster Let's say we could have uh, four uh, Spark application namespaces, but Spark applications from an arbitrary number of queues are spread across these four namespaces. Unicorn manages the queue utilization in memory and uh, enforces the queue limits. For the next portion of the talk, I want to focus on a few highlights of our platform. 
I uh, previously mentioned the, the synergy between Spark Operator and Unicorn. Uh, we implemented uh, changes in both uh, these projects to support the integration. To be uh, more specific, uh, Spark applications submit, submitted by the Spark Operator can be uh, GAN scheduled by Unicorn. Uh, and this is an option. It doesn't have to be the case. Uh, Unicorn also supports uh, scheduling in their regular or uh, non-GAN uh, mode. Uh, also, the piece of work that we contributed to Unicorn enables it to see the Spark application ID uh, the same way the Spark driver sees it. Uh, as a reminder, uh, Spark driver will generate a string with uh, the prefix Spark uh, for the application, and uh, Unicorn and the Spark driver see the same Spark application using the same uh, Spark ID, uh, the same application ID. The second highlight that's uh, worth mentioning is that uh, the integration with the Datadog that we implemented. Uh, this is very straightforward, and you can use any other monitoring solution. Uh, the way it works is that the uh, Datadog agents uh, that's deployed on the ECAS cluster will scrape Prometheus metrics exported by the Unicorn uh, scheduler, pod, uh, scheduler pod and uh, um, make, uh, make them available for visualization and monitoring. Uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. Let's look at uh, a sample visualization in our Datadog uh, dashboard. Uh, what's shown here is the real-time usage of memory and CPU for uh, one of the uh, queues that we, we have. Uh, the user can, uh, the user that, or the owner of this queue can monitor at any moment how much resources are being consumed by their applications. Uh, they can also set up automated alerts. For example, they may want to take some action uh, to request a larger queue, for example, if their memory utilization is above a certain threshold, like 80%, uh, it's totally up to the user. And you can see here in the graph on the left, uh, there's a plateau at uh, around uh, 1 p.m. That was because during that time, uh, this, uh, this queue, the applications in this queue have already reached this queue's maximum allowed memory limit. Unicorn will make sure that all new pods uh, all new incoming pods to this queue are pending until resources are freed up uh, as pods complete or terminate uh, in this queue. So uh, if you remember, uh, the default scheduler's uh, behavior in this case will just make the application uh, fail when you submit the job, when the queue is full, or uh, when the namespace is full. Uh, overall, these dashboards are an important tool to enable self-service for our users that provide them with a uh, with a clear visibility into their resource usage. It serves as a basis for uh, our uh, user job tuning and optimization as well, because they, they know how much resources are being used. Uh, I'll conclude by offering a glimpse of uh, what we are building next and how Unicorn can uh, keep helping us in the uh, next leg of our journey. Uh, first and foremost, we want to uh, realize the true benefit of the cloud environment and operate our, pla uh, our platform uh, in a more cost-effective manner. As mentioned earlier, we'll use Unicorn's uh, GAN scheduling and beam packing capabilities together with the Kubernetes uh, cluster autoscaler to, to achieve efficient autoscaling. We'll also need to further integrate and test Unicorn with features of Spark and its ecosystem of uh, open source projects. In particular, along the same uh, lines of uh, uh, saving cost, we plan to support dynamic allocation in the future, also to decouple uh, compute and storage uh, in Spark pods. We plan to use remote shuffle service. Another highly requested feature from our users is uh, job priority. Uh, users need their Spark applications in a queue sorted by priorities. Also, a high priority job uh, could uh, potentially preempt uh, or evict a low priority job that's running in the queue if, if the queue is running out of resources. Uh, these features are yet to be implemented in Unicorn, uh, but Unicorn has already laid the foundation uh, to support all these, all these features. Uh, last but not the least, we would like to get a more fine-grained view into the utilization of uh, AQ's resources. The data, data dashboard that I just showed is the CPU and the memory request uh, in uh, uh, real time. But each Spark pod may use a uh, lower amount of resources than it requests. So if we can have an aggregate view of how much resources are actually being used versus uh, requested, then it will be uh, super useful to our users for optimizing their jobs. 
that's all I have for today. Hopefully my talk uh, gave you a practical use case of Unicorn at a uh, really large production scale. And I hope you enjoy uh, join us in the uh, Unicorn community to make, make it an even better project. All right, thanks. Thank you.